Okay, uh, good afternoon. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of CHOICE and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Post-COP26, Driving Climate Action, which is sponsored by the OECD iLibrary. Uh, today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from CHOICE and ACRL that addresses new ideas and develop developments of interest to the academic library community. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. Uh, so all of the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off, so don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. Uh, we've got that taken care of for you. Uh, and uh, We're using the Q&A feature today. Uh, please use it to ask questions of our presenters. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for, so please do type your questions into the Q&A module as they occur to you. Uh, also note that there is closed captioning available for today's session. Uh, to toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Uh, also note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. Uh, and with that, we're ready to get started. So I'll pass things over to Danny Ryan for a brief introduction. Well, thank you, Sabrina, and thank you to Choice and ACRL for hosting us this morning, this afternoon. Um, on behalf of the OC Washington Center and OECDI Library team, I'd like to welcome all of our attendees today. My name is Danny, and I'm a Public Affairs and Outreach Officer at the OECD's North American office in Washington, D.C., where we serve as a resource to lawmakers, government agencies, civil society, and academia, connecting them with the work of the OECD and our expert colleagues themselves. If you're not already aware of us, please save our contact details when you receive the email following today's event. We are available in the US time zone to respond to data requests, iLibrary subscription inquiries, or any questions related to the work of the OECD. The OECD's iLibrary is a central knowledge base of OECD expertise, providing access to the latest OEC recommendations, analysis, and data to 2,500 subscribed institutions with over 7 million end users. Please visit OECDILibrary.org for books, papers, and statistics related to today's, today's topic and 17 other thematic areas of the OECD's work, including environment, economics, trade, and development. With that brief overview of our US office, I'm delighted to welcome our moderator, Ben Geeven, uh, Axios Energy reporter, as well as our panelists, Ingrid Barnsley, OECD Deputy Director for OECD Environment, Andrew, uh, Andrew Neustader, Lead Climate Lawyer at the US State Department, Noreen Kennedy, Senior Vice President of Policy and Global Strategy at USCIB, and David Wozkow, Director of International Climate Initiative at World Resource Institute. We will first hear from Ingrid, followed uh, by remarks from Andrew, Noreen, and David. After, we will jump into a panel discussion and q and I've done enough talking, so with that, I'm happy to pass over to Ben. Ben, over to you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining and for having me here today. I think this is going to be a really this is a very important and well-timed discussion, and I think it's going to be really lively too. So uh, I'm Ben Geeman, as, as Danny said, I'm an energy reporter with Axios. And with that, let's, uh, let's jump into some, uh, some opening remarks and starting with Ingrid. Thank you so much, Ben. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks very much to our DC colleagues in the OECD DC office and equally to Choice and ACRL as our co-hosts for for bringing us all together this afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be joining you from, from France uh, and to join a, uh, such, a, such an esteemed panel speaking about climate change as well as, as participants in the audience. We're gathering at a pretty extraordinary moment for climate. And I think one could argue that every moment is extraordinary in the fight against climate. And there have been other key moments in the past, but the current time still feels nonetheless exceptional for several reasons. We've never had such a strong political momentum globally to act on climate change internationally than as we, as we saw at COP26 in the lead up to COP26 and after COP26. Secondly, we've never had such strong scientific evidence from the IPCC, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and I would say such broad public awareness of climate change as its impacts start to be felt around the world. And we have so much investment from stimulus programs, from economic recovery programs coming out of the COVID pandemic, of which around 20% are actively targeted toward environmental goals, according to our numbers. Only 20%, but still a very vast sum in terms of, of the overall amount of recovery packages. And yet, despite of that, despite that, all that momentum, those net zero targets, renewed commitments, uh, increasing awareness, 
we saw emissions rise globally in 2021. We see a disconnect among the general public between knowledge of climate change and their sense of agency or their ability to change, to contribute to change. And we're facing sky high energy prices and rising living costs in many countries as the pandemic rumbles on and as we see growing geopolitical tensions perhaps in some areas. So in this context, we need to ask ourselves what can be done finally to make a real difference this time, seriously get us on a net zero pathway before we run out of time. Now, we know the existential threat of climate change. Um, we know that it is interlinked to the biodiversity crisis globally and the multiple impacts of both on people. Um, so I won't go into that now. What, what we increasingly realise is that this needs to be addressed as a core economic challenge to our, to our whole entire economic system, not just addressed by climate or environment experts. And our sense is that the OECD has a lot to offer in this regard. As I said to the panelists just before we joined the audience, you know, my job today is to tell you a little bit about what the OECD is doing in this space, as well as speaking to the climate challenge more generally. So the OECD has, has been one of the leaders on climate related policy and data for several decades now, supporting our member and our partner countries in terms of domestic policies and technical work to feed into their dialogue at international negotiations. But what's really changed for us in the last few years is that climate change has become a central theme across the broad remit of OECD work. So we have begun to really mainstream climate thinking into cross-government work on economics, on tax, on trade, on public governance, on labour and financial markets, on social equalities and inequalities and so on. So um, we're really working now toward this, this whole of government approach. And in that regard, I wanted to just say that we fully commend the current US administration for its leadership in terms of really driving a whole of government approach um, in the US context. So a few quick remarks about what, what this means in an OECD setting before we, we pass on to the other panelists. Um, we have a new Secretary General, Matthias Cormann, who arrived at the OECD. He took up functions on the 1st of June last year. And that prompted us at, at his suggestion and at the suggestion I would say of our member countries and including the United States to think about what is our value added in an increasingly crowded space. It's become a very noisy space. Um, so we, we have been encouraged by our new Secretary General and by our member states to focus on our unique strengths to support countries in seeking to address climate change across the breadth of government. So we reflected on this and we thought through some of those strengths uh, and they've defined the strategy that we've now built out or that the Secretary General with members has now built out. Firstly, we cover almost every sector of the economy and breadth of government activity with a few notable exceptions such as defence policy. Um, the, the next point is that we have multidisciplinary co competence covering macroeconomic and structural policies, for example, almost across almost all areas of economic activity. This is becoming increasingly relevant because what we realise with climate policies is that we need to have integrated, almost systemic approach to how we're going to deal with this challenge. Um, our sense is that we have quite a strong convening power, bringing stakeholders from both OECD and non-member uh, countries together. And as distinct from some other international organisations, we have a very strong committee structure at the technical level. So before something reaches the political level, it's been through multiple rounds of technical discussion across different areas of government. We also have a strong focus on peer learning. So member to member discussions, not just secretariat led discussions and a really strong reputation around the collection um, and analysis of internationally comparable statistics, measurement frameworks and evidence-based analysis. And that's becoming increasingly important also as well as we try to move from targets uh, into meaningful implementation of policies and, and track their implementation. So that's led us to an approach to climate change that is whole of organisation, as I said, and is based around five pillars, pathways to net zero, adaptation and resilience to climate change. And this notion of resilience may be one that comes out in the discussion this afternoon. Public and private finance, investment and business action as the third pillar. The fourth is monitoring and measuring progress toward net zero. I mentioned already the idea that not only do we need to have targets, but we need to be checking if they're, what, what impact they're having. And the last is around multilateral and multidisciplinary approaches to, to driving cooperation um, in this space. 
So these pillars guide and organise our approach and they, they very much led our contributions to COP26. A few quick remarks on, on COP26 then. It was of course a landmark moment in terms of our multilateral progress. Uh, and like all international negotiations, it was an exercise in compromise. It's typically pretty easy to, to criticise. It's a lot easier to actually run one of these things and be one of the negotiators. Um, COP26 succeeded in keeping the 1.5 degrees goal within reach, and it shot a, shone a spotlight actually on the need for near-term action at the same time. Um, and I would say full kudos, of course, to the UK government uh, and its co-presidency for its leadership and management of the conference, but also I do want to acknowledge in the context of this discussion to today, the renewed leadership of the United States and how critical that was in bringing much needed wind back into the sails of multilateralism at a critical moment. Personally, we were very pleased to support Secretary Terrett Kerry and his team in the run-up to COP. Uh, notably, both Secretaries Blinken and Kerry attended the OECD Ministerial Council meeting in Paris of last year, and that, that followed meetings of our Secretary General with, Senator Kerry, with Secretary Kerry um, in Paris, and we saw significant increases in ambition uh, across mitigation, mitigation, adaptation, and finance as a result. So, so that's what we saw uh, in, the, in the context of COP26, and we may in the discussion go into some of the details about you know, what in concrete terms came out of that negotiation. But for now, we, we're in a situation where countries are now looking ahead toward Egypt, COP27, and what they're focusing on is more ambitious action in the near term. And again, the OECD is seeking, seeking to help with that. So what were we doing behind the scenes in the lead up to COP and what is going to continue now through to COP27 in Egypt at the end of this year? A lot of our, our some of our work is highly visible. Other parts of it are done at the technical level. And so they're less, they're sort of some of the best kept secrets, so to speak, of the OECD. Um, in terms of flagship products, many of you may be aware of the International Program for Action on Climate that was launched at the OECD Ministerial uh, Meeting last year, chaired by the United States. This product is designed to complement uh, UN processes in supporting countries to track and monitor their progress toward net zero emissions by 20 to 2050. This is being done through a detailed dashboard of indicators which allow for comparison and understanding of cross-country efforts and through then regular monitoring and country-specific evaluation. Second, second pillar of our work uh, leading up to uh, Glasgow and into Egypt is around promoting transparency and action on climate finance. And this work is done very much in conjunction with donor countries, including the United States. This work is around tracking progress toward the so-called $100 billion goal under the UN framework with forward-looking scenarios as well. These are designed to support transparency and trust among parties, which in turn help to encourage further commitments that are, that are needed. Additionally, just before COP26, our Development Assistance Committee, which oversees official development assistance, very critically agreed on the future alignment of all official development assistance with the goals of, of the Paris Agreement. So that's going to have real implications in, in particular in relation to support for future, uh, future coal-fired power stations, for example. Thirdly, uh, we, we made a major contribution, but a sort of a quiet contribution, I would say, to the very delicate negotiations around several areas. One around so-called losses and damages from climate change, which is a subset of the discussion around ad adaptation. Uh, and the second around finalization of the so-called Paris Agreement rule book, which is looking at issues, for example, of how you recognize domestic carbon mechanism, carbon market mechanisms um, under the UN framework. These are just some of the ways we directly fed into the COP. The OECD has many other areas of, of climate work, perhaps one, one or two to mention here. Um, one is around sustainable finance and ta taxonomies for sustainable finance. This is happening in many ways in parallel to the COP process, but is really critical in the investment and financial sector, including in the United States. Other work is around the political economy of reform. It's one thing to have a perfect policy package. It's another to successfully implement it and bring your general public with you, particularly at a time of rising energy prices. And also work, for example, around skills and education. I mentioned before the disconnect for many people, including young people, between their knowledge of climate change versus their ability to feel that they can actually contribute to the solution. Um, so looking ahead, 
it's critically clear that we need to convert long-term ambition into near-term results. And the OECD is continuing to support that through, through some of the ways I, I mentioned. Uh, we're, we're continuing to mainstream climate change right across the work of the organisation. And we now have a major OECD-wide project on climate and economic resilience. And I, I come back briefly to that work. This work is really about ensuring that countries, uh, ensure that countries, that climate change, I should say, features at the heart of thinking on economic, economic resilience coming out of the pandemic, both in terms of a sustained pathway to net zero. So that is one that anticipates and responds to possible disruptions. And at the same time, building resilience to climate impacts themselves. In this regard, it's worth noting the very substantial work on economic recovery and, and that's been done in the context of Build Back Better um, and stimulus programs such as this, and, and the US is a good example there. Um, the last point I wanted to mention, so IPAC will continue as a very critical project for us this year. We're going to continue also to do work around what some term as the just transition, but we focus on ensuring the transition is fair and equitable and leaves no one behind. That means a focus on jobs and labour markets, on skills, including into adulthood, and on the distributional effects of climate policies, as well as on embracing the notion of environmental justice, which has very much been spearheaded in the United States and is, is helping our own learning at the OECD. The last point I wanted to mention, because this may be of interest to some of the audience, is a new initiative at the OECD called uh, the Inclusive Framework on Carbon Pricing. This is building off the very successful work of the OECD around international agreements on tax, including the Inclusive Framework on Base Erosion and Profit Shifting, or BEPS, uh, as well as the work around a digital tax agreement. Our interest is to foster multilateral dialogue on both what we call explicit carbon pricing as well as what some might term implicit carbon pricing. So that is countries that quite understandably have maybe chosen not to go for an explicit carbon price, but are using other policy levers to effectively impose what is an implicit price on, on carbon. So we know that there are a range, there's a diversity of mitigation efforts out there. And what we're helping to do with this, uh, with this initiative is, is foster dialogue on policy stringency and its relative cost and impact uh, in order to support uh, global discussions in that regard. So with that, uh, let me finish by saying I'm really delighted to have the panel here with us and delighted to have this discussion with some of our US stakeholders. At, and we're going to really continue our close cooperation with the US. On our side, we're delighted to have just uh, embarking on a, um, on, on a chapter with a new US ambassador who notably has pointed to the environment as, as a key priority for the United States in terms of its collaboration with the OECD. Back to you, Ben. Many thanks. Thank you, Ingrid. I think that was a very clear-eyed and complete uh, look at what, both what the daunting challenges are ahead, but also what some of the reasons for optimism and hope are uh, given the efforts of different stakeholders. And I think that's a very nice segue to bring us now to some brief uh, opening remarks from Andrew from the State Department. Uh, great, thank you, thank you, Ben, and uh, thank you, Ingrid, for your opening remarks. And I'm very pleased to be here today to join this uh, wonderful panel. Um, we have worked very closely with the OECD for years on our climate-related diplomacy, um, and it's great to see sort of leadership coming out of the OECD and uh, along all the fronts that that Ingrid described. So, what I'm going to do is I'll just give a brief overview. Uh, for, uh, from the US government perspective of what our objectives were coming into Glasgow, uh, what we see as the main outcomes coming out of Glasgow and, and what comes next. Um, so on the first part, uh, heading into Glasgow, um, US objectives included a few things. First, that, that we would leave Glasgow significantly more on track to keeping a 1.5 degree limit within reach. Um, second, uh, I think recognizing that we wouldn't simply be able to leave Glasgow having closed all the gaps and sort of tied a bow around 1.5. Uh, we wanted to emerge with collective commitments uh, from parties to continuing uh, strengthening climate ambition, particularly in this decade. Um, uh, third, uh, that we wanted to secure ambitious outcomes around uh, outstanding elements of this, the so-called Paris rule book, which, which Ingrid mentioned as well. Um, some of these objectives related to the formal negotiations, such as the rule book, um, 
others related to increasing ambition through various types of efforts, which includes national efforts, various multilateral initiatives, and collaboration with different stakeholders. Um, and from the U.S. government side in, in the lead up to Glasgow, really the whole year uh, after President Biden was inaugurated and starting on that day, you saw a lot of effort towards achieving these objectives from the highest level. So, for example, you saw President Biden uh, convene leaders of major economies twice and announce uh, various goals and commitments. And you saw tireless diplomacy uh, from, from our special presidential envoy. John Kerry and from Secretary Blinken and from a number of members of the cabinet and other senior leaders. Um, so, so that was sort of what we were looking at coming into Glasgow. Uh, how did that all work out? Um, so with respect to the first part of, of leaving more on track to keeping 1.5 within reach, I think we saw a lot of progress uh, before and at COP26. Uh, so, that includes enhanced NDCs by many parties, including the US and, and, and some of the other major economies. Uh, we saw leader level commitments, such as commitments to end deforestation and the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forests and Land Use. Uh, we saw various announcement of initiatives uh, in which parties and stakeholders uh, are going to pursue um, efforts to reduce emissions where we see real opportunities. So an example of this is the US and EU led Global Methane Pledge. Um, and we saw various commitments from civil society uh, and from private sector um, that all sort of contribute to that, sort of putting us more on track to keep 1.5 within reach. But but again, as I said before, I don't I don't think we had any illusions that what we did sort of gets us all the way there. So the second one again was sec securing commitments from parties to continuing strengthening climate ambition. Um, so the main thing there is the parties adopted. Uh, the Glasgow Climate Pact, um, uh, which is a consensus decision. So all, all 190 whatever parties uh, to the Paris Agreement adopted this decision, reflecting the need to accelerate action during this decade. Um, and it calls for specific efforts and establishes various processes, not only on mitigation and emissions reductions, uh, but also on sort of all other aspects of the Paris Agreement including adaptation and finance. Um, uh, finally, on the last one, with respect to completing the rule book, we did conclude um, outcomes on all of the outstanding elements of the rule book, which, which coming into the COP, there was a real question of whether we would do that. Um, so that included guidance on use of carbon markets under the Paris Agreement, um, the reporting tables for national greenhouse gas inventories, and tracking progress towards NDCs. Ingrid it sort of mentioned some of the OECD work related to that, but that's really sort of um, at the heart of how the Paris system works to have that, that transparency. So those were quite, quite critical. Uh, and finally, a decision on what we call common timeframes that um, essentially urges parties to submit NDCs that will cover the same time period going forward, specifically submitting in 2025 an NDC with a 2035 target and so on. So, so that's that's sort of in a in a very brief nutshell how we see see Glasgow. So, looking ahead to COP twenty seven and beyond, um, I think we're looking at this year as what what Secretary Kerry calls a year of implementation plus. Um, so, this this first means uh, that we need implementation of existing goals and commitments. Um, some of those that I that I referenced before. So, this is. Um, you know, national implementation of NDCs, net zero strategies, other goals and commitments, finance pledges, et cetera. Um, implementation by um, international institutions and organizations such as the multilateral development banks uh, to make sure their activities are aligned uh, with Paris goals. Uh, implementation of, of those initiatives I mentioned such as the global methane pledge and, and, and really <laughs> dozens of other initiatives. Um, and then sort of within this sort of more negotiations process, implementation of the processes we've established under the Paris Agreement, including several that were launched in Glasgow. So a work program on the global goal on adaptation, uh, uh, working towards setting the post-2025 collective finance goal um, and um, engaging in dialogues on support related to loss and damage. Um, 
so that's the implementation side. But as as Ingrid mentioned, and uh, as the as the Glasgow Climate Pact uh, itself makes clear, and as Secretary Kerry has himself been very clear about, we're still behind and not where we need to be. So that's kind of where the plus comes in. Um, so, for example, we don't yet have all NDCs aligned with the Paris temperature goal. Um, and the Glasgow Climate Pact sort of specifically calls for, for countries to align their 2030 targets this year. Um, uh, as another example, uh, on the finance side, the, in terms of implementation, the donors need to implement the $100 billion mobilization goal. Again, the Glasgow Climate Pact uh, calls for that. Um, but we also need to sort of Paris align what, what people call the so-called trillions of financial flows where we really can't keep uh, 1.5 alive. So those are just a few examples, things that will be important to make progress for a successful COP27. Um, and again, as, as with our object objectives for last year, some of these play out sort of through the formal negotiating agenda. Others happen outside the negotiating agenda through efforts of parties and other stakeholders. And, and that's why I think it's sort of particularly interesting and helpful today to, to hear from Ingrid uh, from the OECD side, but also from Noreen and David about uh, sort of some of the other stakeholders' uh, perspectives on these issues. Uh, yeah. And with that, I will turn it back over. Thank you. Thank you for those remarks. Um, and next we're gonna move to uh, Noreen from the US Council for International Business. And, uh, but let's also make sure we keep our remarks uh, kind of brief because here's the thing, we've got some questions pouring in already and they're really, really good. So I wanna make sure that we have time to, to get to those as well. So, uh, so now I'd like to introduce uh, Noreen from the US Council for International Business. Okay, thanks for that, Ben. And uh, it's really a delight to be part of this discussion. And I very much appreciated uh, perspectives from, from Ingrid and Andrew, and maybe I'll already start to answer some of the questions that are piling up, but I'll try to be very, succinct. Um, I think it is important to say a few words about the organization that I work with, United States Council for International Business, because it will kind of inform uh, what I'm about to say. Uh, as an organization, we're based in New York with a DC office. We represent US business, mainly the Fortune 500 companies, um, about 300 of them alongside business associations and law firms. We're entirely focused on international policy, we promote rules-based multilateral trade, open markets, sustainable development, and corporate responsibility for and by US companies in the global marketplace. What makes us extremely special is that we have affiliations, which are our entry points into the multilateral system. We're, part, we're the US affiliate of the International Chamber of Commerce, which is the focal point uh, for the UNFCCC for business. We are the US employers representative in the International Organization of Employers. So we are definitely looking at just transition issues, not just for workers, but also for employers. And last but not least, we are the US affiliate of business at OECD, also known as BIAC. And for those that don't know BIAC, in every OECD member state, there is a dedicated business office like mine, which brings the voice of business uh, well-informed, uh, working closely with the OECD across all of the disciplines that Ingrid described to us. Um, our priority policy areas for our members and where I have uh, a particular lead role uh, concerns environment, sustainability, and climate change, whether we're talking about the sustainable development goals or our support for the UN Framework Convention and its Paris Agreement, where we've been involved since 1993. Um, we were in Glasgow, um, we have standing at the UN Framework Convention, we have standing at the UN Economic and Social Council and at UN Environment Program. So to summarize and give you some sort of keywords, we're multi-sectoral, we're economy wide, we connect the dots, we're about long-term engagement. And I really wanna build on something that Andrew said in his remarks and really recognize uh, all the hard work that the administration did as well as the delegation in Glasgow not just in taking an all of government approach, but also mobilizing an all of society approach. And that's really what I wanna focus on uh, here today. As you can probably tell, I've been to a lot of meetings uh, in my 30 years at USCIB, but I have never seen a meeting like Glasgow, not just because of the turnout and the accomplishments, which are considerable. I, 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 I absolutely agree with the assessments that we've heard. Uh, but also because we've never seen that kind of a turnout from US business and indeed from business writ large. 
Um, I mean, we had hundreds of CEOs on hand, thousands of business people from, of course, my organization, other US organizations, but really from all over the world. Um, and we saw both in the run up to Glasgow, and again, thanks to very strong uh, efforts by the White House and the State Department and other parts of the administration, uh, voluntary efforts coming forward, um, and, and, and really the list is too long. It would take much more even than the, the, than the short time I have. $130 trillion was pledged. Um, however you count it, it was really uh, an astonishing, astonishing vote of engagement and willingness to move forward. And then the second thing I would just say is that that momentum continues. Normally after a COP, at least in my organization, other business organizations, and I've been to now 26 of them, people kind of collapse in a heap and try to regroup after a COP. Not after this COP, um, the momentum is strong. People are already planning for COP 27. It could be bigger than, than COP 26, but this is really an opportunity that we have to seize. I, I fully agree with, with a lot of what Ingrid said in her comments, but I'll also make an observation. You would never know from the concluding documents of COP26, the strong response of the private sector. Disappointingly scant mention of business. As far as the outcomes would express, it was like business was never there. And we didn't pull our weight except for some actions relating to Article 6, the carbon trading, carbon pricing, what have you. Where our outcome documents from Glasgow do refer multiple times to many other constituencies. Business was barely name checked. Um, compare that if you would going back to the documents when you see references to youth or to women or to workers. And of course, we're very well aware of the mantra. This is a party driven process. It's an intergovernmental meeting. But anyone who only read the, the outcome documents would take away the impression that business basically sat Glasgow out when nothing could be further from the truth. So what I really wanna talk about as an opportunity to scale up action is what we can do to drive meaningful inclusion and mainstreaming of business, because it will be indispensable to keep 1.5 alive and in reach, to ramp up even further deployment of innovation, to mobilize all that money, and to be part of that just transition, not to mention a host of other areas, including the adaptation and resilience. Yes, this is an intergovernmental process, and yes, that's fundamental to its accountability. But in my view, as a junkie of multilateral <laughs> processes, um, it broke the mold. And mm -hmm. it showed that you could do intergovernmental plus, plus, plus and get more and better. And by the way, what is an organization that exemplifies that intergovernmental plus, plus, plus value proposition? It is called the OECD. So in our view, and I'll try to uh, conclude because I know we're trying to uh, wind up quickly. We know that countries are now called on to adjust their ambition upward in the coming year, as Andrew said. Shouldn't business communities be part of that rapid discussion and NDC ratchet process in time for COP27? I know WRI has done a lot of work in the past about how you can design the NDC process so that it is fully consultative and brings in other stakeholders. Here's a great opportunity to take advantage of the momentum of COP26. And, and put it to work. How about um, the global stock take that's coming up? What can the UNFCCC do to engage abundant and diverse and very motivated business expertise in that global stock take? I, for one, am certainly looking forward to being part of the BIAC delegation at the next OECD Climate Forum in March, which will talk about exactly some of those issues. So the OECD is, as far as we're concerned, plays a central role across all of these climate action areas. The UNFCCC is a treaty basically about everything. Uh, and it's very good to have the OECD there. Um, as the OECD explores moving ahead with some of those landmark uh, projects that, that Ingrid talked about, BIAC will be there. And we'll bring our expertise and perspective, not just from our environment and climate change experts in the business community, but also our tax experts, our experts on comp competitiveness, on trade, um, and, and put that together and it'll be more than the sum of our parts. So to close, I just wanna leave the following points. This is a moment now between COP26 and COP27, indeed to incent and strengthen business action and dialogue as a resource for the UNFCCC in Paris 
agreement, but it is not only about Article 6. What can we do to consult with and reflect business in the new improved NDCs so we can get that ambition up? How can we incorporate business and business pledges in the global stock take and going forward? We certainly look forward to working with OECD and all of you to reflect on and really see if there are opportunities for institutional innovation so that we can seize this momentum and carry it forward. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Noreen, for that perspective. And now we're gonna to move to um, our final panelists opening remarks. We're gonna get another stakeholder perspective from uh, David from the World Resources Institute. Thank you. Um, great, thank you, Ben. And um, it's terrific to be here with all of you today. Um, so I, I will be brief because we I think we do wanna hear um, uh, from, from uh, the audience uh, and have a good question and answer opportunity. Um, as has been said, I think, as has been outlined, there, there's sort of two truths about um, Glasgow. Um, on the one hand, we made a, a, a significant progress, and I think we really have to um, keep that uh, very much um, front and center and keep that in mind. If you think back to Paris, the, the notion that we would have had net zero commitments from the very wide range of countries and companies and and cities and other subnational governments, I think that just wouldn't have been something that we would have contemplated. Um, and there was progress on other fronts, but we also know at the same time that, that we're not yet on track, that we haven't gotten to where we need to, that much needs to be done to put us on track for 1.5 degrees and also to address many of the other issues that need to be addressed, building adaptation resilience and, and providing the kind of finance that's needed. So, with that in mind, um, I, I'll just highlight quickly three tasks that I think we have going forward. Um, one is on the, the mitigation side, on the emissions reductions. And um, there, I think we got some important directional arrows out of Glasgow um, that we have to take seriously this year and in the next several years. Um, and that includes a call for countries to enhance their, their 2030 targets as necessary, it says, um, to be aligned with 1.5 degrees. There's a call for uh, long-term strategies out to mid-century that are aligned with net zero emissions. Um, and there are other processes, the global stock take, a work program on ambition in the 2020s. So that clearly has to be um, uh, very much in mind as we head toward COP27. And, and ambition, um, where we're headed, where we want to go and need to go, very central. At the same time, we do need to focus significantly on implementation, as has been said already, and really, and, and, and reflecting some of what Noreen was saying, really embedding a multi-stakeholder approach. This has to be all sectors, all actors across the board, and to do what we call um, uh, ambition loops, that, that those, those, those various actors strengthen, make possible what governments can do, and governments then also need to be working in ways that help um, uh, mobilize action on the ground. Um, so that's that's number one. Um, number two is on the finance front, and I'll focus especially on the question of, uh, of impacts, climate impacts. We're about to see in about two weeks the Working Group 2 report come out from the IPCC. I think it's going to give us very stark uh, a, a very stark vision, in fact, of, of where we're headed on impacts, what we already see and what we're going to see. And so we need the finance um, and the support um, for vulnerable countries, for vulnerable communities to be able to deal with that, in addition to the finance that's needed for the grant green transformation. Um, and uh, just to say a couple of things on that. I mean, first of all, we're not yet at the $100 billion as the OECD project projections showed. Um, and I think that was a very helpful um, outline that the OECD provided last fall of where we stand. Um, so we need urgency to get there. Um, we saw a commitment at Glasgow to double adaptation finance um, by 2025. So we need headway on that. And then lastly, the, the the critical and complicated issue of loss and damage. And, and there I would just note that um, this doesn't have to be an issue of liability and compensation uh, in the negotiations. And in fact, if you look back at Paris language, that was taken um, essentially off the table. Um, but we are seeing impacts uh, for vulnerable communities, for vulnerable countries, 
uh, that can't be adapted to. And there are serious losses and damages, and we need to find ways to support those who are losing their homes, losing their livelihoods, losing their access to water supplies and food security. And so that's a very basic issue that I think will be a burning one in, in many ways for COP27. Um, and then lastly, um, there are many, as has been said, many sectoral commitments, non-state actor commitments that were made at Glasgow. We need to make sure that those are followed through on. And um, we work as part of this science-based targets initiative. It now has a standard for net zero, what kinds of trajectories um, businesses need to be on track um, for net zero. Uh, the Secretary General now has an expert panel uh, in place to look at the question of what it means to get to net zero. And so we need to make sure that across the board, and this includes things like on methane and forests and so forth, um, we're actually making headway and, and taking those kind of commitments seriously. Um, and then the last thing I'll just note, um, there was a question about just transition. And the, the quick answer is absolutely just transition issues need to be um, central to what we do. and. Um, and we need uh, that in order to do what's right, but also in order to gain the support that we need from the public for the kinds of transformation we need. So I'll end there and thank you very much again. Thank you to all the panelists. I think that set the stage really beautifully. I'm just gonna jump right in by kind of merging one of the questions that I had with one of the ones that came in uh, from the audience. And that is about the kind of global repercussions of US policy, or in some cases, the absence of policy. You know, we've, we've of course seen uh, President Biden's um, large domestic climate investment spending package uh, stall in Congress and the prospects of it are very uh, uncertain, I think to say, to say the least. Andrew, I'd like to ask this to you, but I'd like to hear from all the panelists, uh, who, any of you who feel free to jump in as well. Andrew, to what extent is the kind of stall of the Build Back Better investment agenda coming up in discussion with global counterparts as the US tries to press other countries to take strong domestic actions at a time when President Biden's domestic agenda is facing such headwinds in Congress. And I'd like to hear from anyone else who wants to jump in as well about how the kind of um, ebb and flow uh, and, and candidly the stall of the US uh, legislation is affecting your discussions with colleagues um, uh, globally. Uh, uh, thanks, Ben. Um, so I'll give a brief response. Um, uh, in terms of sort of the specifics of Build Back Better and <laughs> where things stand on that, I'd, I'd have to defer to the White House. But in, in terms of how sort of our engagement with others, what, what, I, what I can say is that internationally and in Glasgow, I think other parties saw that from the first day of the administration, the president on down has been making substantial efforts and has, has a, a commitment and that's been reflected in policies uh, on achieving our goals. Um, and Secretary Kerry has a close partnership with Gina McCarthy. They're working together and with the rest of the USG on achieving those goals. Secretary Kerry has emphasized that, you know, there are multiple pathways to get to, to our goals and to our NDCs. We're working on all of them. So that includes um, a lot of work on uh, domestic executive action through existing authorities. So we've seen action on um, HFCs and methane, among others. Um, we've seen also efforts in Congress, the, bi the bipartisan infrastructure law does, um, does a lot as a start and in, uh, including towards building a green power grid, uh, investing in um, EV infrastructure and much more. Um, so I think, you know, at least internationally, what we're seeing is a recognition that we're making efforts. Every country <laughs> has domestic challenges and issues, um, um, but, but uh, that, that, that's how I see it from my perspective. Thank you. Did anybody else want to jump in there about the uh, what you've seen as the repercussions or absence of repercussions of the kind of um, ebbing and flowing of the president's agenda on Capitol Hill? Um, yeah. I mean, can I just quickly come in here? I mean, this is yeah. not something that Please. we normally. Yeah, it, it, I just want to say that the takeaway, the temperature, let's say that, you know, I take from our membership and from the assembled masses of the business community in Glasgow and after Glasgow is that they're pressing on regardless. Mm. That's why I say that this moment of, of momentum without getting into our Washington politics is, 
pretty close to unstoppable. I'm not saying it's easy or straightforward. Um, and Ingrid mentioned some of the headwinds now that are in front of us at a global level. But um, the, the sense that I get, at least as a US business person working in the international arena is we're moving ahead. And we've been in this for a long time and we've seen administrations come and go. And we're just going ahead here because this is truly a long-term important venture that we are dedicated to. Thank you. Um, Ingrid, I wanted to move back to something that you said at the, uh, in, in your opening remarks, which is that um, you know, there are reasons for optimism right now about the global trajectory of emissions cutting efforts. But you know, as, as, as you noted, I think we're also quite, quite off track. Um, the science on some level sort of is what it is on, on what the needed emissions cuts are gonna be. And so I suppose I'd like to ask, to what extent are these very high energy prices we've been seeing, especially in Europe, but also elsewhere, to what extent are, is that causing um, headwinds toward global action to sort of move away um, more aggressively from fossil fuels? Or to what extent perhaps does that create opportunities? Thanks very much for the question. I think it's an extremely important one, taking account of the fact that, uh, of course, energy related emissions contribute a very significant proportion of our overall human induced emissions. Also bearing in mind that uh, globally energy demand looks set to continue to rise, in particular in so-called non-OECD or emerging and developing economies. So, so we need to find a way to allow those economies to continue to develop and to ensure affordable, secure, modern energy services while also addressing our climate goals. Um, there's, there's no doubt that uh, in the lead up to COP26, this created some noise and a bit of a blip, shall we say. Having said this, um, energy prices, as with other commodities, go through cycles. That's inevitably what we see. We realise that this is not the first time we've seen energy price spikes and it won't be the last. Uh, it, sometimes it's in relation to fossil fuels, but it can also be uh, obviously in relation to electricity. We, we can see this uh, dips in prices in the context of costs, in the context of renewables. Um, in, in actual fact, our argument has been that uh, the spike in energy prices that we saw in the lead up to COP26, in fact, reinforces for us uh, the need to ensure uh, that we align our energy goals with our climate goals. Um, let me explain this a little more. Uh, what we need is a resilient economy, and a critical component of that is, an, is a resilient, resilient energy and electricity sector. Uh, and in many instances, a singular reliance on fossils is not, in fact, the best way to ensure uh, stability of prices uh, necessarily. So whether we're talking about wind power or we're talking about uh, access to, to gas from, from, uh, from imports from another country, it's clear that we need to build diversification uh, into our model and to anticipate fluctuations in prices. So uh, in the context of the OECD's arguments, we've said that we should take advantage of, of the reality of fluctuations in prices to ensure that we, we actually see a better alignment with, with uh, the low energy or the so-called clean energy transition. It should not be used as an excuse to see us um, go back uh, toward fossils. If anything, high prices might be partly a sign that the energy transition hasn't gone far enough, that mm. systems are not yet as diverse and resilient as we would wish them to be. Thanks. Thank you. Um, David, I wanted to know if you, if that's something that you wanted to jump in on, but I also had a, a, another question I wanted to steer your way as well. Um, so feel, feel free to feel either one of them. Um, it's about sort of the scaffolding and structure of the COP process. I mean, we hear so much discussion about targets and NDCs. And now, in fact, we've seen this effort to have countries come back even more frequently with efforts to increase their ambition. And so I guess I'd like to ask, are you concerned at all that with all of this emphasis on countries ramping up their ambition, that the public might not sort of understand or might not have the ability to necessarily realize that this gap between ambition and on the ground emissions cuts is actually uh, widening, not shrinking. So I'm wondering, you know, heading into COP26, is there any effort to kind of reframe the kind of discussion about ambition versus policy implementation? Yeah, um, thank you. On, on the um, previous question, I, I would just agree with what Ingrid said that um, that the the energy price spike, um, in our view, should be a motivator to shift to renewables. That 
um, will be much better insulated from the kinds of dynamics that, that we've seen recently. Um, the, um, in terms of this question of ambition and implementation, um, I think in many ways, they're two sides of the same coin, and we see them as really very integrally linked to each other. Um, ambition clearly needs to drive implementation on the ground, and there needs to be accountability. I think that certainly holds true in the um, in the UNFCCC context and around NDCs, and, and also net zero goals need to be um, something that uh, there really is implementation against, and, and near-term targets and action that um, actually put countries on track for that. Um, uh, and so it works in that direction, the, 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 the two sides of the coin. But the other, the other piece is that we really do need implementation to be able to um, create the space for increased ambition. Um, we need to see that things are working on the ground, that they are providing the benefits that they are um, uh, in terms of jobs, in terms of uh, reduced health costs. Um, uh, in terms of uh, healthier ecosystems. And um, that, that approach that really looks at the benefits and, and how we are being able, how we are able to move forward, especially with um, continuing falls in the prices of renewables, battery storage, EVs, et cetera, um, can drive the kind of ambition. It can lay the ground for the kind of ambition that we need. So I think these can work in tandem. Um, we are going to need to see there's sort of a cascading question of accountability, I think. We have net zero commitments now that would uh, lead us to 1.8 degrees in warming, but we also know that the 2030 targets would are not quite aligned with that. And in fact, they only get us to about uh, down to 2.4 um, degrees. So not, not really where we need to go, even for those net zero um, commitments. And then in turn, we need to make sure that action on the ground achieves the NDCs. So we have this cascade and we need to be looking across those and see those actually working in tandem. Thank you. Um, Noreen, I wanted to return to something that you said that I thought was quite interesting, which was the, how you felt. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think essentially you were saying that there was this disconnect about how active the business community was, uh, both in the run-up to COP26, at COP26, continued momentum, you know, people not just collapsing in a heap, but pressing on ahead. Um, you know, one of the, I think the one of the topics that's really important right now in discussion of uh, the business community is the role of natural gas. You know, we saw so much emphasis on coal at COP26, but you know, I think right now with the Ukraine crisis. And for other reasons, we're seeing a lot of reminders of the geostrategic importance of, of natural gas. But at the same time, we, you know, we've got this recognition that pathways to deep decarbonization mean moving on from all fossil fuels. So I guess I wanted to ask you, can those two things be squared? And how does your organization see the role of natural gas in, in energy transition? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I mean, I, I just have to really fully agree with what Ingrid said a little while ago, which is that, we know that access to energy and energy security is a fundamental and understandable preoccupation of every national government and certainly of the private sector. And what that means is planning and, diverse, and diversification. Mm -hmm. um, so if the planning is telling us that in as a transitional fuel, natural gas is the step that eventually gets us free of a dependence on dirtier coal and sets the stage for renewables, then that's fine. That's a good thing. Um, we simply cannot, I think, at this, at this stage of the game, even with falling um, prices for renewables, et cetera, et cetera, really practically say that we can somehow make a quantum leap um, in terms of our energy systems and infrastructure and the global markets and global connections that come along with them. But certainly we are very keen and we understand that part of the necessary transformation is around our energy system. There have been a couple of questions, if I might just quickly speak to them in the, in the Q&A. One asking about the role of small and medium-sized companies. And I think that's a really important question. Um, particularly in non-OECD countries. And I just wanna say that this is a, a priority uh, both within business at OECD and also of the International Chamber of Commerce to raise awareness and engage small and medium-sized players as well as 
you know, through larger companies like the, the members of USCIB that can reach out through their supply chains and engage with, with smaller companies and make sure they understand both why this, is, why this is a critical issue from an environmental perspective, but also where it provides a business opportunity. And then on just transition, again, I think that if we're serious about just transition, and I know we are, and it really matters deeply, we have to have the full social dialogue and include not just the workers, but also bring in, of course, our partners in government and our partners from the employers community. So hopefully as we just create those, those conversations, whether in the International Labor Organization, OECD or UN Framework Convention, that we bring employers to the table. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andrew, I have a question that I wanted to move it back, uh, back in your direction. You know, we had the US hosted and led major economies forum um, on energy and climate. We had that um, meeting quite recently at the minister level. And you know, coming out of that, there were some hints or teases, I suppose, that the US is looking to kind of expand upon or perhaps even start some new international goals or coalitions around uh, clean power targets, uh, perhaps broadening out um, something on electric vehicles and perhaps expanding methane efforts to countries that are not currently part of the methane pledge. So I guess I'd like to ask going forward as, as the meth has been sort of reconstituted as an important global forum, what should we see next? What's, what's coming next from the, from the MEF? Will we see some new uh, targets, international targets um, around clean power, electric vehicles, or, or methane? Uh, uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, and yes, we just did, uh, Secretary Kerry hosted uh, the MEF, I think it was last week. Um, and there, there is a, a, a media note that released the chair's summary that, that describes some of the initial discussion. I think if you look sort of historically at the MEF, um, you know, back over a decade, it really started as a venue for the major economies to, you know, when we were negotiating the Paris Agreement to sort of ag agree on some principles or building blocks or find ways forward. It, now we're, as we're sort of <laughs> getting to the end of the regime building within the, the Paris Agreement, you're right that there, there is a discussion happening about you know, how can we use this forum where we have the major economies that are responsible for, uh, you know, the vast majority of the emissions to um, make progress in, in different sectors. So, you know, that, that's a discussion that will keep happening in the MEF at the ministerial level, eventually, uh, I expect at the leaders level, um, you know, I can't predict exactly what will come out of the MEF, um, but, but um, you, you know, that, that's something where I think we see value in, uh, of how the MEF can proceed in, uh, in a different way. Thank you. Thank you. And with the, uh, with the limited time we have left, I'd like to ask any of the other panelists, you know, the, certainly the MEF has emerged as a very important international forum. The OECD, as we've been uh, discussing, is, is becoming increasingly active on this front. Um, uh, Noreen or uh, David or Ingrid, what are some of the kind of uh, tentpole or benchmark events that you're going to be looking for ahead of COP27 that you think will give us the best signs as to whether this ambition that we hear so much about is going to start translating into on the ground emissions cuts? If, uh, if, if, if Ingrid, if, uh, um, you know, what's, what's your, what, what are the biggest items on your calendar in the, in, in the months before COP27? Sure, sure, thanks. Um, uh, this time I won't speak to OECD so much as to say, uh, typically in a context such as this, we've had the MEF, as was mentioned. Um, we would look to, uh, we would typically be looking to see what the G7, first of all, might be doing, how they might seek to, to drive ambition. We know that Germany has been calling for a so-called climate club. Now, really important to note, as I understand that they're not seeking for that club to comprise G7 or OECD countries only, rather they're looking to countries that are like-minded in terms of their interest in genuinely increasing ambition and matching ambition with meaningful standards and actions now. That's the notion of their club. So the G7 will be a first one. Um, it will also be very interesting to look to the G20 here. Um, I would say that uh, it's, it's very interesting because we have this year a non-OECD country uh, in, in the presidency of the G20, that's Indonesia, and we're looking at several years of non-OECD countries in the chair. Now, when I say OECD, what am I saying? I'm talking about emerging economies 
who typically are viewed as having a, a different role in the context of, of, of perhaps that, our climate history, but are now not only major emitters, but are projected to continue to be very significant emitters in the future. In the case of uh, Indonesia, we have a country that is pursuing... Mm -hmm. oh. oh no, you've frozen. <laughs> Uh, 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 Noreen or David, while we, with, with the remaining time we have left, while we try to unfreeze, uh, while we try to unfreeze Ingrid, I guess, you know, what are, for you, what are the most important uh, signs and pathways on the road to, uh, on the road to COP27? Um, so uh, I can jump in quickly. I, I would echo Ingrid in terms of um, those moments. The um, G7 that Germany has indicated strong interest in sustainable and resilient infrastructure is a major theme. Um, and they also have a very um, strong interest in, in clean energy transitions. And I think that actually um, translates over to the G20 where Indonesia, um, one of its major three themes is around um, clean energy transitions. And I, I think just transition um, hopefully will be sort of threaded through all of that. Um, the other uh, moment that I would note is around the UN General Assembly, and I think there's likely to be, if not sooner, a major economies forum meeting at uh, heads of state there, um, based on what the US has said, Andrew can correct us on that. Um, but, um, and I think that that will be an important moment leading up to the COP as well. Thank you. Um, you know, this has been a, a great discussion and you've all have set the stage for us uh, beautifully in terms of uh, looking ahead to to COP27, uh, what, what was and was not achieved at COP26, and how much there is to um, look for in between. So is that, with that, I'd like to thank all the panelists uh, very much and throw things back to Danny for some closing remarks. Thank you so much, Ben, for your terrific um, moderating, and thank you to all our speakers. I, I think we, we've we've lost Ingrid, but better we lose her at one o'clock and not twelve o'clock. Um, <laughs> so thank you to uh, to Ingrid, to Noreen, to to David, to Andrew, to Ben. We could we could probably go on for another hour discussing these issues, but alas, we, we must wrap up. Um, I want to thank um, our partners, Choice ACRL, for hosting us today, uh, and I'm happy to pass over uh, back to my colleague Sabrina to close us out. Great, thanks, Danny. Um, yeah, I'd just like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program, so be on the lookout for an e a follow-up email from Choice and ACRL with the link to the recording. Uh, also, give you a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, uh, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, also, if you're interested in finding out more about the OACDI library and how it would benefit your research team, re please reach out to Ian Williamson, ian.williamson at oacd.org. Uh, Ian's contact information will also be up, be in the follow-up email. Uh, so thanks again to all of you out there for joining us. Uh, we hope you learned a little bit or a lot from this session, and we hope to see you again in the near future on another webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Really appreciate thanks. the discussion. Many thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. <laughs>